Andrew Yang absolutely blew up the internet, uh, what is it, two nights ago now? I think it was two nights ago now. One night ago or two nights ago? It's neither here nor there. He tweeted, I'm standing with the people of Israel who are coming under bombardment attacks and condemn the Hamas terrorists. The people of New York City will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere. So, uh, one of the many reasons why this was tone-deaf at best, grossly unethical and immoral at worst, is that this was just a few hours after Israel bombed Gaza, killing at least 20 civilians, including nine kids. So, there's a, a very, uh, you know, complex situation unfolding right now. I mean, I don't think you could talk about uh, Israel-Palestine without bringing up what is effectively the original sin of illegal occupation and expanding these settlements against international law. But there was also Israel um, basically storming the Al-Aqsa Mosque and, you know, using tear gas and rubber bullets and going after um, Muslims, Palestinians who were worshipping. This is, of course, you know, a holy site in both Islam, the third holiest site in Islam. It's also a holy site in um, Judaism. So there's there's these planned illegal evictions going on in East Jerusalem, which is another gigantic issue. And in comes Andrew Yang, and he doesn't say anything about the illegal occupation, anything about the illegal evictions that are currently going on in East Jerusalem, doesn't say anything about the Israeli troops storming the mosque when Muslims are peacefully praying. Nothing about any of that. I'll repeat his comment. It was, I'm standing with the people of Israel who are coming under bombardment attacks and condemn the Hamas terrorists. The people of New York City will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere. Again, this was just a few hours after Israel bombed Gaza, killing 20, including nine kids. So, um, I'm going to get to Andrew Yang's apology. So, he came out and was like, oh, there's a lot of backlash over this. I don't like the backlash. Let me tell you why uh, I'm wrong. So, we'll get to that in a little bit, and I'll tell you whether or not it's sufficient. But first, listen, he has, you got to keep it real, man. He has a history of just absolutely sucking on the issue of Israel-Palestine. So I'm going to show you a little compilation here. It's not really a compilation. It's two separate video clips. One is from when he was running for president and he was asked a question about the, the aid we give Israel, the subsidy we give Israel, including the military aid. And then the other one is when yours truly and Crystal Ball had Andrew Yang on our podcast on Crystal, Kyle, and Friends. And we asked him about his insane comment basically comparing BDS to Nazism. Take a look. Uh, in terms of the money we're giving to an ally like Israel, um, my first instinct would be like, why would we reduce it? Uh, you know, uh, and so, um, so certainly if I communicated something else, like uh, that's not the, um, the idea at all. Um, there are certain relationships we have that to me, we need to rebuild and strengthen. And I would suggest that our relationship with Israel uh, is one of them. And what about the Arabs? Um, you know, you'd have to look at it in a case by case and say, like, what's happening in terms of our, our bilateral relationship with a particular party. Um, but my my zeal is to try and build strong alliances and partnerships. If someone's been working with us for a long time, they should feel like they're being rewarded for that, frankly. And then if someone has an interest in working with us, we should uh, be open to rewarding that, too. Um, but for each country, you know, like you'd have to look at what's going on um, at that time and what the lead in has been. So when it comes to land in Israel that's uh, being taken, even though it was granted to certain Palestinian families by the UN, uh, how do you feel about uh, constricting Israel almost to prevent that from happening and uh, constricting uh, political influence by American leaders in Israel? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll answer it more generally. Um, which is, like, my, my, my stance on this is that it's going to be hard for the United States to constrict, like, uh, a, a, an ally or really just about any 
of its partners uh, in a decision that they feel is central to them. And I don't think that's our priority. It's not that we're somehow giving people aid so that we can then twist their arm about things that, uh, you know, that they find important. But I also want to level with you. I really hated what you wrote about BDS in an op-ed that was generally about your approach to the, to the Jewish community. You said a Yang administration will push back against the BDS movement, which singles out Israel for unfair economic punishment, not only as BDS rooted in anti-Semitic thought and history, hearkening back to fascist boycotts of Jewish businesses. It's also a direct shot at New York City's economy. Do you see criticism of Israel as fundamentally anti-Semitic? I do not see criticism of Israel as fundamentally anti-Semitic. Um, I think BDS is a very different thing than criticism of, uh, let's say, the Netanyahu administration uh, or even of uh, some of Israel's policies. Well, it's an attempt to push back on the occupation of the, the occupied territories, that what's seen as an illegal op occupation by international law. It's modeled on the successful movement in South Africa. It's nonviolent. What is it about that movement that you single out to say that is anti-Semitic and equivalent, I mean, equated essentially to fascism? The BDS specifically, as an organization, as a movement, uh, has refused to disavow extremist elements that have frankly uh, declared uh, that Israel does not even have a right to exist. So that's quite extreme. It's very, very different than what you described earlier, Crystal, in terms of people having a political point of view on Israel or an administration or its policies. So it's not the tactics per se, but some of the people that are involved that they haven't uh, condemned or distanced themselves from? Is that the issue? Well, oh, so BDS as an organization, as a movement, uh, has refused to uh, to disavow uh, extremist elements that have essentially said Israel does not have a right to exist. So, Andrew, uh, let me ask you this then, because the more I looked into BDS, the more I saw nuances and perhaps, you know, it doesn't make the most sense to take the most extremist elements of, of a group and define the whole movement that way. And, you know, we've learned that lesson in the context of other movements and other groups. But would you concede that there's a difference between, say, boycotts, divestment and sanctions of all of Israel versus boycott, divestment and sanctions specifically of the illegally occupied territories? Because, again, as Crystal pointed out, that is the model that effectively worked in apartheid South Africa. No, I'm not sure I, I understand the distinction you're drawing, Kyle. Genuinely, like I'm just not sure I understand it. Um, right. I can explain it further if you want. It's the areas that it's all it's it's a matter of historical record and fact that are being illegally occupied right now. That the international community all agrees. There's no dispute over it. Some elements of the BDS movement only want to boycott, divest, and sanction from those particular areas. So, in other words, the other areas of Israel they leave alone, but particularly the occupied territories, they say, let's do boycotts, divestment, and sanctions in order to try to bring about Palestinian human rights. Don't you think there's a difference between boycotting in the areas specifically where they're violating international law and boycotting areas where they're not? Uh, I'm on the record as supporting a two-state solution, which I think is a fairly uh, mainstream perspective. And if I understand your question, uh, Kyle, you know, people who are advocating for a two-state solution, uh, I would agree with that sentiment. So here's the other thing about it, Andrew. Why did you want to make this statement? Because I guess what bothered me, I'm just leveling with you on this, like you'd taken some criticism in the Orthodox Jewish community because of the position you had and some of the statements you made about circumcision. And then you put out this statement. I mean, I know you make the case BDS is tied to New York City's economy as kind of a tenuous connection there. Why was it that you decided to make the statement? Because it felt... I'll just be frank with you. It felt like pandering, which is not something that you normally do because you've taken criticism in this other area and you wanted to go over, you know, over and above to signal your support here. Just talk a little bit about your thinking of why you thought it was important to put this in this particular op-ed. The economic ties between New York City and Israel are very, very significant and very real. So I wouldn't just uh, put that aside, Crystal, especially if you're in the situation New York's in now. Um, and uh, with the... the so, sorry, you said something else in, in your, oh, it was uh, uh, it was around whether this was sort of an over, uh, like a, a response to something that had gone before. Um, it, it's genuinely uh, the case that New York City is the home to more Jews uh, than any place outside of Israel. It's like a very, very serious uh, responsibility to the global Jewish community. Um, and it's something that I would take very seriously as mayor. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's something that I think you do have to think about the context of New York City for the, the global community in that light. And that was frankly a bit of a learning for me where I, I frankly did not realize just the level of importance of the mayoralty of New York City to the global community. So final follow up on this, then I promise we'll let it go. But my question is, if if Palestinians resist violently, that they, that's called terrorism. Everybody says terrorism, they denounce it. If they can't resist peacefully through boycotts and sanctions and an economic approach, what approach would you say is okay? Like, how can they resist to try to bring about human rights and end the occupation and, and have a state? How can they resist 
that's acceptable if they can't do it peacefully and they can't do it violently. Uh, I, I think that that's an oversimplification, Kyle. I think that there are many peaceful ways to advocate for a two-state solution uh, that don't involve uh, some of the measures that BDS has recommended. Take note, he did not answer that last question. He did not give an example of how it would be actually okay to resist. Because my question was not an oversimplification, it was very straightforward and it's very accurate. Whenever Palestinians resist violently, that's called terrorism. Whenever they resist non-violently, they're called anti-Semitic and told they can't join those movements, movements like BDS. So what way is acceptable to resist? There is no answer. He doesn't give an answer. He says there are other ways. Okay, well, name one. He doesn't name one. So there's a lot of stuff there that is, let's be totally blunt about this, horrendous. Horrendous. He's really, really, really bad on this issue. Um, I don't know how many of you remember that first clip that you saw there, but that was during the presidential campaign. And he said, why would we reduce the money that we're giving to our ally Israel? Maybe because of the illegal occupation, the expanding settlements, the violations of international law, the apartheid system. Maybe that's why. Maybe... We, us giving them money and weapons for their military and them, then them using those weapons for unethical and immoral purposes, maybe that's a huge problem. By the way, just so everybody understands, we gave them a $38 billion subsidy at the end of Obama's time in office in 2016. $38 billion subsidy. So you and I are paying for when they bomb civilian targets. And we'll get to more on that later. They're bombing many civilian targets, no matter how they try to tap dance around it and act like it's totally justified somehow. It's completely not justified. And we wouldn't accept it from anybody else. Um, so now let me give you his non-apology apology. He says, I spoke to a group of volunteers for the campaign yesterday, some of whom have been with me for years. Many of them were upset with my recent tweet expressing solidarity with the people of Israel in conjunction with the violence in the region this week that has claimed the lives of innocents and children on both sides. They expressed to me that they follow and support me for a number of reasons. One is that I am a clear-headed person who follows facts. The other is that I am a human being who stands for universal values of fellowship and goodwill. They felt that my tweet was overly simplistic in my treatment of a conflict that has a long and complex history full of tragedies, and they felt it failed to acknowledge the pain and suffering on both sides. They were, of course, correct. I mourn for every Palestinian life taken before its time, as I do for every Israeli. Suffering and pain and violence and death suffered by anyone hurts us all. All people want to be able to live in peace. We all want that for ourselves and our children. Support of a people does not make one blind to the pain and suffering of others. Again, most everyone simply wants to be able to live and pray in peace. And that is what we want as well. I join with millions around the world in praying that the current situation be resolved as quickly as possible, peacefully, and with minimal suffering. For those who have spoken to me on this, thank you. Continue to believe in humanity. Now, people who are huge supporters of him might read that and think, oh, great. So this is him apologizing. This is him, you know, correcting his mistake. Let's be serious here, guys. He did not say in this apology, he did not mention Israel's apartheid system. He did not mention the words illegal occupation. He did not say expanding settlements. He did not bring up the evictions in East Jerusalem. He did not say the words ethnic cleansing. There's nothing there about the nature of the conflict and how we got to this place. He didn't even bring up Israel storming the mosque and shooting rubber bullets and tear gas at people who were peacefully praying. He didn't even bring that up. So if you're not going to bring up the evictions, you're not going to bring up international law, you're not going to bring up human rights, you're not going to say the word apartheid, you're not going to say the word illegal occupation, you're not going to say the words ethnic cleansing, all of these things are accurate in describing the situation, then effectively this is a non-apology apology. You know, you're saying, oh, I care about what's going on on both sides. Okay, that's great. Now would you like to maybe issue potential solutions and say, hey, maybe we should stop arming and funding the Israeli government if they're going to target 
civilian populations as they've done. And if they're going to kill innocent civilians and children as they've done. We give them a lot of money, many weapons, and a lot of support. So the taxpayers in the U.S. are responsible for the actions of that government to a large degree. They're our ally, so we have some degree of control over what they do. There's nothing there that expresses a solution. It's just like, man, this is really bad, and you know, I'm on both sides, and I condemn both sides. And so, like, can't we all just get along? Can't there just be, like, peace and stuff? It's deeply unserious. Listen, the thing he said about why would we cut the subsidy off, terrible. The, the non-answer on BDS was terrible. And you guys go back and watch it again. Crystal and I push him very hard a number of times, and he's still not giving a direct answer. And what he said originally was straight up sociopathic. And what he's saying now is doesn't really make it any better. So now also, let me be clear about something else, man. A lot of people see this. This is one of the problems when you get to a big enough size, you'll say something and some people will interpret it one way and another group of people will interpret it another way. And it doesn't matter what I mean when I say it, because people could just interpret it wrongly and run with it. And so one of those things is this idea that I endorsed Andrew Yang for mayor. I never endorsed Andrew Yang for mayor. You know what an endorsement for mayor is? An endorsement for mayor is, I support Andrew Yang for mayor of New York. That's what an endorsement is. I never said those words. Never said those words. Another endorsement, I, I'm going to vote for Andrew Yang for mayor of New York. I never said those words. Never said those words. If I wanted to say those words, if I wanted to endorse him, I would have said those words. Now, by the way, I don't even live in New York City. I can't even vote in the mayor's race. So this idea that I, I should make some sort of an endorsement, I barely made, I barely said anything for the presidential race in terms of what I was going to do. I waited till after, I think, to say what I was going to do. So I don't know why anybody thinks I, I should sort of weigh in on that and comment on that. The thing about Andrew Yang that I've talked about, and I still will talk about because it's accurate, I will give him credit when he takes correct positions. I like his UBI. I like his statement on decriminalizing all drugs that goes even above and beyond Bernie. I like his statement on decriminalizing sex work. Again, that goes above and beyond Bernie. And I like what he said about circumcision. And mainstream media smears him all the time with terrible arguments, so of course I'm going to call that out. I, on this show, what I do is I give credit where it's due, and I critique where it's due. That's all. That's all. So I don't know where anybody got the idea from that I endorsed him. If I was going to endorse him, I would have said, I endorse Andrew Yang. No, I've given him credit when he says correct things that I like, when he advocates policies that I like. And I called him a uniquely honest voice because I thought he was a uniquely honest voice. But when you see how terrible he is on this issue, mm, I overstated it. He's a sometimes honest voice and sometimes terribly unethical and immoral. And that's exactly what's happening here. And so... It really is unacceptable. If you're going to talk about this and you don't bring up apartheid, illegal occupation, ethnic cleansing, don't talk about it. And as people have pointed out, he's running for mayor of New York City. He doesn't really have anything to do with foreign policy. Why is he even doing this? I'll tell you why he's doing this. Because when he made the comments, he came out basically against circumcision. He said, I, I didn't have my kids circumcised or something like that. Um, you had the ultra-Orthodox community was furious. Because not only do they believe in circumcision, they do this, and I'm not kidding about this, guys. It sounds fake, but it's real. They do this ceremony where you have a rabbi cut off the tip of the baby dick, that circumcision, and then suck the tip off. That happens under the name of religious freedom. And so Andrew Yang took the tepid position of saying, I'm not, we didn't circumcise my kid. I'm not for circumcision. And then, of course, he backpedaled a thousand ways and said, whoa, 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 well, I'm not going to ban it. If you want to make the decision, you can make the decision. I'm not going to crack down on the ceremonies and whatever. And so ever since he said those words, he's afraid he totally lost the Jewish vote in New York City, which is very important in New York City. So ever since then, it's been a pander fest. How do I get him back? How do I get him back? How do I get him back? I know. Let me express unwavering support for Israel, even when they're massacring civilians. And that's effectively what he did. And then now, 
trying to clean it up, he still doesn't mention anything about the real nature of what's going on there. The original sin is the illegal occupation, period. The expanding settlements, period. The violation of international law and human rights, the apartheid system, the ethnic cleansing, the evictions in East Jerusalem, which are happening now. They're happening all the time. They've postponed them because of what's been going on, but they're happening. And I just want to give everybody one more sense of what's going on there because this really puts it in perspective. And then compare this with how Andrew Yang responded. This is from Human Rights Watch. The discriminatory treatment with the exact opposite legal outcomes for claims of pre-1948 title to property based on whether the claimant is a Jewish or Israel, excuse me, Jewish Israeli or a Palestinian underscores the reality of apartheid that Palestinians in East Jerusalem face. Nearly all Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem hold a conditional, revocable residency status, while Jewish Israelis in the same area are citizens with secure status. Palestinians live in densely populated enclaves that receive a fraction of the resources given to settlements and effectively cannot obtain building permits while neighboring Israeli settlements build on expropriated Palestinian land built on expropriated Palestinian land flourish. Israeli officials have intentionally created this discriminatory system under which Jewish Israelis thrive at the expense of Palestinians. The government's plan for the Jerusalem municipality, including both the West and and occupied east parts of the city sets the goal of maintaining a solid Jewish majority in the city and even specifies that the demographic ratios it hopes to maintain. This intent to dominate underlies Israel's crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution, which Human Rights Watch documented in a recent report. If you're not going to talk about that, then don't talk about any of it. He wandered into a minefield, and now he's going to suffer the consequences, and he should.